It should be recording. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the third episode. If you're on the podcast, if you're on my YouTube channel, it's a video series, Make America Debate Again. I'm here with Lev Polyakov. He is an animation director and a content creator. I was on Twitter. I said, who wants to debate? Let's go. Uh, you know, who's up for it? And my friend Jules said, uh, my boy Lev, you know, he wants to debate. We talked about it. So I'm going to let him introduce yourself. But I want to say real quick, this is just a testament to if you have ambition and passion and if you're on the ball timing wise, you know, the world is an open oyster. So I know for myself, I won a rap contest in 2008, 2009, when I had no followers or subscribers, but I was always looking for stuff. And even for me, a lot of people aren't this accessible and uh, open, but I really am. If people have good energy, they're ambitious and on the ball, uh, anything can happen. So that, that's the, the motivational, inspiring thing for the day. Lev, take the floor, let people know what you're about, and then we'll get into it. Make America debate again. Yes, sir. Anomaly, thank you so much for having me, man. I appreciate it. And I think that the universe works in these kind of ways when you uh, least expect that certain things end up coming into fruition. There, I think, mm -hmm. is no reason for me to uh, have the kind of things that I have right now. I grew up in uh, St. Petersburg, Russia, mm -hmm. back in the Soviet Union. When I was four years old, that's when uh, our whole family moved to the United States. And that was also just a matter of luck. It was just a matter of having the right bureaucrat who looked at us up and down and said, all right, fine, you can go. That was, <laughs> that was what it took. So it wasn't a way uh, blind luck, but who knows? Maybe it was faith. Maybe all these things are engineered in a certain way. But anyway, I'm in America. I go to Catholic school. Then I drop out, get homeschooled, go to ballet school, go to the Lee Strasberg Theater Institute for Acting. And then I uh, drop out of that, go to School of Visual Arts for uh, animation, get my uh, wonderful animation degree, which really took me to a lot of places. I, it, it was all right. Like I took perspective class, animation class. I got a lot of really practical knowledge on how to draw stuff, which I think is really important. But after that, I just started uh, working freelance, making my own films. I got my films into a bunch of film festivals, toured all of that around, and uh, now I am in a position where I'm the chairman of the Art and Technology Committee at the National Arts Club in Manhattan, right around Gramercy Park. And Amazing. how that happened, no, no idea. You know what I mean? Like, it just, I just met somebody, met somebody else, and uh, now I'm talking with you. So again, all these things are coming into fruition. You must be a little ambitious then, you know? You got to have some ambition to get that stuff done. But oh, no, I'm not laying around eating potato <laughs> chips all day. I am, for the, for the record. I, I am laying around and eating potato chips. I'm just lucky in this era I can do that and use my phone at the same time so I could double task and still make a living. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, a phone is a very uh, hard thing to get off. Like I noticed that when I pick up, I uh, scroll through the feed and I'm aware that I'm doing that. I'm like, Lev, you are scrolling through your Facebook feed. There is no reason for you to get this information right now. You have to go to sleep. But at least there's that inner voice that we have that tells us that we have to get back on track. So beyond all the things that I'm doing right now with uh, the YouTube series called uh, Levin Jules Break the Rules that I'm doing with my wonderful friend or your friend Jules Hamilton. Besides that, I'm meditating a lot. I'm doing the Wim Hof method, which mm. allowed me to, uh, have you ever heard of DMT? I have. And the Wim Hof method, for people who don't know, that's, that's a breathing technique, correct? Exactly. It really expands your lungs and maybe mind. And yeah, I've, heard, I've definitely heard of DMT. Actually from Joe Rogan when I was very young. So Joe Rogan was talking about DMT when I was like 18. I was like, oh. Same here. And from the Wim Hof method, I was able to secrete DMT. I believe it's DMT. I'm still like, the jury's still out. Wow. But basically you do this breathing technique and you start secreting DMT, epinephrine, norepinephrine. And I started getting psychedelic visions just from uh, breathing in an otherwise sober state. I started to see this uh, light in the very center and this halo that was flashing out. So like people talk about the third eye, like in yoga class, concentrate on your third eye. There yeah. is a literal third eye. Wow. We're going to have to talk about that after the podcast because I've been very interested in the breathing techniques and I'm, I'm always interested in any sort of health stuff. But uh, you're a living a proof of, of that method leading to something even more spiritual and psychedelic. So we're going to have to talk about that. Absolutely. So for in the, in the spirit of Make America Debate Again, I know on Twitter you were saying that I'll let you kind of explain your part and then we'll have a conversation dialogue slash debate on it. But I guess you were saying that the mainstream media or the neoliberal media, whatever people would like to label it as, 
that you feel that they they should pander to maybe the far left or you know that's kind of what they've been doing slash becoming that maybe and your thoughts on it i'll let you take the floor and really explain it but are that that actually makes sense in a, in a big strategy I've been seeing, as I'm sure you have, a lot of ugliness going on in the media, especially when it comes to how they've been reacting to Kanye West, how they've been portraying Republicans in general. I think it's very ugly, it's very disingenuous. And I've also been seeing a lot of very professional looking uh, placard stickers and posters, like people say, like, oh, George Soros pays for all this, whatever. The point is, is that they look very professional. A lot of these movements don't look like they're homegrown, grassroots. Mm -hmm. I imagine behind all these words, whether it's woke or white privilege or whatever, I just imagine a boardroom of folks sitting around smoking cigars, a lot of PR professionals thinking, how can we engage with the kids? And uh, unfortunately for them, I think most, not just kids, but adults, I was reading this article in uh, The Atlantic saying, Americans strongly dislike PC culture. Youth isn't a good proxy for support of political correctness and race isn't either. So that's a good sign, but they've got people in the far left people who, if you were to look in the uh, early 20th century, were the anarchist bombers, were the communists who were actually going out and stabbing people and blowing things up. Like, we're talking about really bad hombres here. <laughs> and when, when I'm seeing, uh, what's his name, uh, David Hogg, mm -hmm. out in front of all these people, everybody's being all emotional, everybody's talking in this, uh, this groupthink type way, I'm a little bit relieved because I see the after effects of that. People were afraid that, oh, now that David Hogg's on stage, they're going to take away everybody's guns. But they gave a moment to vent. People had their protest. People had their women's march. People had their march against Brett Kavanaugh. They had it. Then it goes away. And I'm just looking at the reality where we're having a lot of bad things happen from a lot of the uh, Antifa people, like recently. Uh, there was a situation, I believe, in um, uh, Portland, Oregon, where they were blocking traffic and they were hitting people in the cars. That's bad. But if we compare things to things that have happened before, I really don't think it has, it's as bad. And I also don't imagine folks like Anderson Cooper, regardless of whatever CIA affiliations the guy may have, I don't think he wants to live in a communist dystopia where after he walks uh, out of his Manhattan apartment, he sees people you know, on the streets or wearing all gray, like 1984. Like, I don't imagine that the, uh, the elite want to live in a world like that. I think they're as greedy as anybody else and they want to get their way and they're not averse to censorship. But I also think that they want to use these far left elements as attack dogs to get their way politically and then believe that they could draw them in. And my other hypothesis is that if they weren't the ones who were preaching to the far left, the far left would think our voices are not being heard by anybody. I turn on the news, I turn on CNN, I turn on MSNBC, nobody's giving us anything. I'm just going to go to this very charismatic looking uh, dude who's uh, talking about how to build a bomb. Like that I see as being the other alternative here. But I, I don't know. Do you agree? Disagree? What, what do you think? It's interesting. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you came on with that perspective because I guess my thoughts are when it comes to the far left, where I do agree with you on is you don't ever see me talk down about like, I mean, I might make a statement about them, but you don't see me actively arguing with them, calling out Antifa, doing all this stuff all the time because I kind of have a similar mentality in a... I don't have any enemies. I'm not trying to, I'm trying to speak my mind, but I don't really get bothered ever very rarely uh, because I don't actively like try to fight them. And I think a lot of people on the right wing, they are fighting them and then they get hit back. It's like a brawl, the proud boys versus Antifa. They're going to the streets. It's like, this stuff's not organic. They're both going to these things to do it. And then they act like they're so surprised. Oh, someone punched me. I was like, well, you went to the street and they went to the, like, you knew that was going to happen. So I do agree with you on that element. I guess maybe where I disagree is seeing some of these people. My thoughts is from, from talking to a lot of people is there's multiple types of Antifa, but I think a lot of them don't even like the Democratic Party. So even with all of this pandering, I don't see it as them feeling like they're engaged. I think there's a huge 
uh, anger and hate there for sure against America. A lot of them are very mad at, I, I talked to someone who was in that mind frame on my last segment, you know, very mad at Israel, very mad at America. And he really doesn't even like the Democrats. So even with all that pandering, it's really not enough. And my thoughts in that element is of, of those people, I think it's sort of a psychological thing where everybody's different. You know, they're all individuals in that movement, but a lot of them, it's almost like they want to just destroy everything. They're like communist type anarchists where they want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. They don't like the system. They want it, they want it cracked. They want it done. They want all the politicians. But my big beef with, with the far left in that sense is that I feel like it's, it's like a, the opposite of change yourself to change the world. Like they expect all these politicians to do all these things. But then when you look at them, and like their leadership, you're like, yeah, I wouldn't want them to be my senator. Like, I, I don't trust them to be my president. So I think they've mastered the art of like hating others and, and minored in the art of like being the, the, the change you want to see. It's easier to be a sideline critic than it is to actually come up with a full scale solution and understand that this world is a, a religious battle, a financial battle, you know, territorial battle. And it's so much deeper th than that. So I, I don't know that I agree that the pandering from the media, my thoughts, I'm gonna let you jump in right in a second, is I think they're losing their party. They've, they've lost millions of normal liberals, libertarians and central moderates to the, the Trump right, because I feel like he's kind of dialed it back and made it more interesting. And then they've gone further. And they're in a 50-50 split with the far left communist socialists versus normal Democrats who, in my personal perspective, the normal Democrat has lost all sense of reality and really all sense of like what they were even three years ago. So I think they're gonna actually get taken over by the socialists and communists. And I, I don't know how that's gonna lead. And I, even the media, I, I don't even know if that the, if their strategy is to tone it down or they're just so far gone that they're like gonna, gonna lose it all. The only way that I'm gonna be able to judge is to uh, look out of my window or uh, go around New York City and just see the level of violence that ends up happening. Back in the late 60s, as we know that there were a lot of fire bombings happening, like the stuff that's happening in Europe right now, I think that is a good window to look on and see, okay, this is where things really end up being screwed up, where the politicians there love to censor people, there's no freedom of speech, people who are against the immigration crisis, they don't have their uh, voices heard as much. So a lot of people end up going into much more far right elements than the boogeyman the media like to portray the right here as being right now. But to uh, your other point, I don't like the fact that the Democratic Party is getting weaker, or rather I should say that I would like it if uh, like a Sticks Hexenhammer 666 had a good point where he said that he would really want there to be a reform movement going on in the Democratic Party if it destroys what it currently is right now and like a phoenix resurrects into something much different where they would still have the uh, face of caring about uh, the workers, caring about the people, but uh, much like we were having a conversation before about you can care about... Uh, black people getting shot in the streets, but you can have two different approaches to how you go about fixing it. And it's very important to whatever intention you have to make sure you pick the right approach. So in my ideal scenario, the Democratic Party would reform itself and would change it to something that's a lot more common sense and a lot more practical. Yeah, I hear you on that, because my thoughts are like, it, it, I agree with you where it would be smart if they were appeasing the far left so they didn't have a big major tantrum and then doing their own thing but my thought is like they've almost given up all of their own values to oppose trump so i see even as the socialists and communists kind of take over their party from the alexandria ocasio cortez's to like the progressive socialist movement i don't even know that they're going to resist them like i don't think their big idea is like man we're gonna we're gonna make sure nobody bombs people and then we're gonna just you know do our own thing i think they're becoming the far left and also what really bothers me about the, the left wing more than the right wing is that they have no accountability and they also are lobbying to import all of these elements. So like you're talking about there's all sorts of bombings in Europe. It's ma mainly because of radical Islamic you know, terrorism. And I'm, I'm a big person on, I won't even say I'm on the right, but I tell people on the right all the time, like every Muslim person is not a bad person. I, there's a lot of great people in America. There's a lot of great people worldwide. There's billions of them. If, you, if they were all radical, you'd know it. You know, you'd feel it every day, but they're, they're not. 
there's a majority that are really good. But there's also a heavy portion that's not. And the left wing doesn't understand that. The right wing thinks everyone's bad. That's not okay. And I, I, but the left wing thinks no one's bad. So it's almost even more dangerous where they're, they're lobbying to bring these type of people in. And those people, there's a good clip I saw in Canada of some guy who was Muslim. And he said, man, I don't know what it is about the far left and like radical Islam, but they always seem to be go hand in hand and they always seem to support each other. So it's like, if it's not getting to that level now, and people have been shot at, people have been, had their ribs broken and, you know, was because of far left policies that they're, they're, they're in this mindset that people are dying and that help people are losing because of healthcare. So it's like, they're, they're using tactics of like dictators where they, they're saying we need total control of healthcare. We need the government to have total control of healthcare, which is a, a radical stance in my personal opinion. It, it gives the whole industry over to the government. But it's not just that they're saying that. They're saying, we're going to hurt you and physically harm you if you don't give the whole thing to the government. That's where they kind of lose me. So I, I just don't know that. I don't know that it's a peasing strategy. To me, it just seems like that's, that's who CNN and MSNBC is. They are the far left, you know, and they're, they're going to only further, even through this, I don't think they're slowing them down or stopping them through their coverage. I think they're empowering them and giving them radical buddies to eventually become even more violent and dangerous with. That is a very good point. And I could also see how the language that CNN and other news publications use does do that empowerment. But then I also think that if they were completely silent, if the news media didn't appease them at all or said like, oh, like you people are crazy, then what exactly would the far left do? I'm just curious about that. Like, would would they not try to find some kind of a leader, some kind of a mechanism where that part that you talked about, the really, um, the really, uh, I don't know if I should call it death worship or if I should call it, you know, people who just want to create chaos for the sake of it because they feel a lot of resentment in their hearts, but people who would be the polar opposite of the idea of you empower yourself, you empower your family, and thus everybody else ends up getting empowered from that. But we're going to impose something and send people to uh, re-education camps if they don't agree with that. Those people you're right that there are people in uh, Antifa in the far left that are like that. But I also see a lot of uh, college kids who aren't having that bad of a life. I see a lot of kids, especially here in America today, if we're talking about the economy. I mean, sure, we had the recession, but things aren't as bad as they were in the Weimar Republic, where people were uh, starving in the streets, families were uh, prostituting themselves to uh, tourists for... uh, pennies on the dollar, like things were really bad during that time. And I think that's a reflection as well of uh, the violence that occurred during the Weimar Republic when we had the uh, proto-Nazis who were fighting against the uh, communists. Like those were- I think things are undoubtedly not not bad, you know, and and that, I mean, thank goodness. But even that, you know, I, I have people who are making six figures a year complaining about stuff of the past. And I understand, but it's like, people are so privileged here. I like, I don't know, you know, I don't want it to get worse, but that, that definitely helps. But you have, you know, Hillary Clinton saying, we don't want civility. You have Eric, Eric Holder saying, you know, we, we, when they go low, we kick them. Like they're literally calling for violence. And I don't, I don't know that it's going to slow it down. I think they're, they're telling their base and they're creating a huge radical base instead of a small fringe group. I don't even think they're, cause say the very, very far left to super radical, I don't even think they listen to the Democrats at all. I think they're they're trying to just smash crap, whether Hillary won or Trump won. They're extra mad because Trump won, and they really don't like the GOP because the far left, I think, historically, obviously, leans more Democrat, but they don't even like the Democrats. So my perspective is that the far, far left, like the super radical ones, they're not listening. The regular far left, like your socialist, communist, and even like nonviolent Antifa members, they don't bother me. I, I think there's a space in our country for it. That's why I don't hate on them. I know there's a lot of people who've historically they've stood up against war and corporations. That's fine as long as it's a peaceful protest and like makes sense. You know, if you're if you're rebelling against the right people. But then you have like the normal Democrats. Now it's not just like a group that goes out every now and then. It's like millions of people who are watching these news stations that think it's okay to not be civil. And like you said, I think the irony of it is this is the greatest economy ever. The unemployment's lower than it's ever been. We're ridiculously a privilege. I know you came from Russia at a young age. Like my my grandparents came from Italy, 
Poland, um, you know, Puerto Rico and worked in factories. My, my parents work hard jobs. They're still working now, you know, not able to retire working, working class jobs to make a living. I get to make a living off my computer and my cell phone and all my friends that complain the most, they have cell phones, computers, you know, dream jobs, a lot of them. So it's like, I, I almost think I don't want something bad to happen, but it's like, even if things were to get worse, if they were to get violent or our country would collapse, I almost think it's like a mindset where like giving them, giving them a hand and being like, here you go. It's almost like they're never going to change. They're never going to learn. And even if things get really bad, they're going to find a way to blame it on someone else. They're like chronic victim mentality blamers and chronic pessimists where it's like, if you can't find something to be grateful with in this America, if it gets worse, uh, I don't know that they're going to get any more less violent. And I think it's, it's not, it's not slowing the far, far left down and it's making the normal left either go to the right or become radicalized. They're, they're convincing millions of people to, to be uncivil. Then that is the great battle that we're currently fighting right now. And even though it doesn't and hopefully won't involve uh, weaponry, it is like uh, Alex Jones always said, an uh, information war where we have to try to either through humor or through convincing uh, just through civil debate talk with people and get them to understand that uh, there aren't these uh, secret hidden bigots and Nazis in people whose views happen to be something that people would consider to be totally normal uh, a decade or so ago. And you're absolutely right. That is a very scary shift that has happened where people talking about border control are viewed as being something really horrible. And I don't like it. I don't like the fact that uh, people have gone this uh, crazy. I view those people, the ones who would never really pick up a bike lock, but who would nonetheless uh, make posts that would uh, support people like Eric Clanton or whatever. Those people, I consider them to be casualties in the information war, mm. where I hope that eventually they're going to see the errors of their ways of wanting to... Uh, destroy people because of this weird perception that they got through the media. I hope all that goes away. I am not a fan. I, I, and I like what you're saying too, because I know I'm sure 99% of people, I won't even say on my side, but they're like, no, we got to fight. We got to this. To me, that is a losing strategy on, on the whole. And even in my content, I think it's been very effective because I'm so kind and I give people their, their space to have their feelings as opposed to like, this is the way it is. I'll be like, I agree with you on this, 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 but this, that is an effective way of getting through. I personally think that the media is not doing that effectively now, but I do think what you're saying is an effective strategy because say the far left, I don't hate on Antifa ever because one, I know that historically Antifa, they've not always been violent. There's, there's some, and of course they get mad and they tend to, but like even now I want to have a conversation with Antifa because I, I had you know a conversation last time with someone who was in that type of mindset we don't disagree on that that much. And to be honest, I even, I even told him, you know, he was calling me far right and like Nazi and all this stuff, which was totally unnecessary and untrue. But I was like, you know what? The far, far left, they hate, they say Israel's behind a lot of stuff. And you go to the far, far right, they say the same exact thing. So I was like, you sound to me like David Duke. I've watched the David Duke interview. He didn't even talk about black people. He talked about Israel and Jews uh, being a genocide state. And then I listened to the far, far left and they're saying the same thing. So I was like, you're not that, the people you hate the most, you're kind of like, it's like you go too far either way, you become the same person. It's like, it's like a horseshoe. Like they're like, oh, I'm like, you're the same person except you're, you know, standing up for white people and you hate white people. And it's like, but you have the same ideology. So I think conversations, that's why I even made this podcast is people talk about each other more than they talk to each other. And if you listen to, I had a conversation with someone yesterday, really, really cool guy very smart but I could tell just by speaking to him he's not been having conversations with people like me or even like a normal Trump supporter who's maybe further right but he's been non-stop listening to CNN or non-stop listening to what they say about him because it was like talking point talking point talking point but when you have when you break it down and you talk to people whether they're far left or far right you'll figure out they're people and maybe they're very hurt maybe they're very lost and, and there's a lot of stuff that everyone feels is not right the far far left I know that they feel like these wars are not right and these corporations are taking advantage of people and they're not wrong. You know, I agree with that. I just, like you said, I don't agree with how they're doing it. I think they're actually making it worse. And now I think they're, they, they don't like the democratic party, a lot of them, but I think they're being used as like little weaponized 
pup pawns of the Democratic Party. And same with the far, far right. I don't agree with their whole overarching theme, but I see what, or, or like the regular right, I see what they mean. I see what's wrong. I just think their solution's not the, like that's the wrong. So when you, you know, if you can give people a little bit and be open-minded, I think that's the way to get through. I'll, I'm going to let you talk in a second, but one of my favorite documentaries, it was Daryl Davis. I forget the name of it, but he was a black jazz player. And he made like dozens of people in the KKK quit the KKK, but he did so not by yelling at them and, and acting like modern day activists do. He was actually so nice to him, to them that like they realized that they liked him more than they liked a lot of their white friends. So they were like, you know what, <laughs> this, this guy, like he's letting me borrow his bus. He's like such a chill guy, such a nice like soul. They just gave up their, you know, put their clan hoods down and were like, you know what, I'm not racist anymore. And I don't, I'm not saying if you're a black or another race, you have to do that. But to me, I think that's one of the most noble things. If you could look the person who's saying with me, I, I want to talk to the biggest black supremacist who hates white people the most, even like a Farrakhan. I like Louis Farrakhan. I know he might not like me based on my color, but I would like to talk to him and be like, listen, I agree with you on like 70% of this stuff. But, and then you give him that and then maybe he'll be like, you know what? If more white people acted like anomaly, I wouldn't hate white people, but a lot of white people don't. That's like, I, I get why people don't like each other because there's a lot of terrible people at high levels doing, doing evil stuff. So I think uh, that's, that's the way to break through. Absolutely. Even if uh, that person may not come to your side, think of all the wallflowers that are listening in. Mm. Some of them may uh, look at this conversation and decide, you know what, this isn't such a bad dude. Why don't I consider some of these points? And that's a strategy that uh, Jules and I are trying to do right now with our show, with reaching out to people on uh, Twitter and debating various things. Like right now, there's currently an open conversation on Twitter I have about the uh, minimum wage law and whether it should be uh, raised or not. Mm. And nobody's yelling at each other. We're just bringing up different kinds of points and other people are paying attention. So that, I think, is a very nice piecemeal way to solve these problems as opposed to... Uh, taking a hammer and just wrecking the whole thing and uh, starting anew because that i think is also a mentality that a lot of people have like uh on 4chan for example there's this uh, meme of uh, happenings where everybody is constantly yearning for there to be some kind of a happening with a nuclear war or some kind of a great disaster because i think Jeez. a lot of people are also bored you know, people want to have some action in their lives. My goodness. Sitting in front of a computer screen. How but bored I, do you got to be to want a nuclear war? These people, <laughs> I'll give them, they need, they well, need a trip percent. I'll give them like well, a $30 Uber, Uber credit or something. They can go to the beach. Jeez. Well, that, that's still an exaggeration. I don't think anybody honestly wants a nuclear war, but it's more of a, uh, it's, it, it's more of a declaration of, I wish there was something I could do. I wish there was an alien invasion. I wish there was something that could unite people together in a fight mm -hmm. against evil. Because just writing stuff on the computer isn't really uh, doing it. But I still think that even writing on the computer if you're just insulting people, even though it does feel pretty good sometimes to do so, if you really, really don't like some person, still though, what does that accomplish? Nobody sees anything you're saying because all that they're seeing is you're calling them, uh, you know, like a commie bastard or something, you know, and they're calling Absolutely. you KKK. Nothing gets accomplished. And like you're saying, I mean, people really undervalue your energy and how that actually changes people around you. Like if you walk into a coffee store and you have bad energy, you might elicit a bad, and, and maybe they won't change, you know, maybe they're having a bad day, but you could really change people around you. Like I, I'll get sometimes like thousands of retweets on Twitter and I see other people who have that engagement and they have like 20 people, you know, wishing the worst on them. Almost no one does that to me. And every time someone disagrees with me, don't you think Trump supporters do this? I'll retweet them and be like, yeah, I do. You know, <laughs> I think you're right. I just, here's how, like, I don't disagree. So I, I think like people really, they, that's why I always say change yourself to change the world because people are in the fight, but they're, it's almost like they're in a fight with themselves. And it's like, they pick the side, they're mad, where if you, you, you get that going on, it's a beautiful thing. And, and you do it on Twitter you do it in real life. I think that's that's the step of the equation that people are absolutely uh, missing, and it would it would do wonders here. That's why with the Kanye thing, I mean, what he did was brilliant. Of my favorite part was he said, "I made a Make America Great hat instead of Make America Great Again to take away the past, and I want you and Kaepernick to wear one." 
And I'm talking about, and they're like, yo, I hate that. I'm like, how could you hate that? Talking about Kaepernick and Trump wearing a Make America Great hat. Like, that's what dreams, that to me, that's what dreams are made of. That's the, that's the level I'm on. I'm like, get them to talk. And you might, like Kaepernick and Trump would probably love each other, but they both have this wall up. Trump has the wall. Build a, he built his own wall, literally. And then Kaepernick has a wall. It's like, put your guard down for one second and see what, like, it, that would be a beautiful thing. And in that sense, you're absolutely right that the media is not helping at all. I haven't seen any news person go on and talk about that particular hat and what message that's trying to convey, nor were they talking about, you know, whether you believe changing the 13th Amendment is going to help or not, at least talk about that a little bit, mm -hmm. or talk about the prison industrial complex or the drug war or yes. all of this important stuff, yet they don't because you're absolutely right that they do want to create, whether it's partly for ratings, partly for that theory of mine to keep people within this uh, certain realm of paying attention to them as opposed to going off to some charismatic leader. Yes. Again, I, I don't know. That's, that's a thought that I have. The other thing, though, that I think may be happening here is we still have a very impressive intelligence apparatus. I mean, maybe not so much for finding school shooters, but uh, for, <laughs> for going into various terrorist groups. Like, I am very sure that among various uh, Islamic organizations in America, there's maybe half of them are CIA agents or FBI agents. You know, maybe in Antifa and the far left, a lot of undercover folks are just sticking it out and, uh, you know, doing drugs and just getting their mind all screwed up. But uh, that's always been a part of American culture too, to have all these spooks neatly pocketed into these various areas that people would find to be subversive. So as much as we hate on the deep state, I think that that may be an asset at the end of the day from preventing there being something more. I don't know. No, I appreciate you saying that because one, one tweet I saw recently that was funny, it was like the CIA pretty much outed themselves. They were, they were on Twitter, they were like, CIA people aren't just officers, we're school teachers, influencers, <laughs> this, that, and they named like 20 things if you were like, well, it's not a conspiracy anymore. Who are you? <laughs> I think you're right, though. And I think uh, even for me, you know, I'm very critical of, of what I think the, the CIA and FBI has done historically and things mm -hmm. they haven't apologized for. But the difference between me and even people on the right and the left is I understand it's not all bad. They might have made some mistakes, but also the world is complex. Even with my biggest opinion and statement that I'm like, I don't agree with this, this, this war, I would still, if a CIA person was watching me, I know that they would feel the energy of like, yo, Anomaly wants to hurt me or stop me. No, I would want to have a conversation because I bet there's some, something that even that person that I think is the worst, that he could tell me that I might have not known and be like, well, that makes it a whole different story. Because it's all, you know, it's like, we didn't do this, this was going to happen. So I'm always more interested in hearing their part. And I always say, even when I critique them, I always say, God bless the FBI and the CIA. And, you know, not in the sense of like, oh, Anomaly is a shill and he... But it's like, of course, there's some great people doing some great things, just like the police officer thing. Like, yeah, F some police, like NWA said, but a lot of them with no police, I, I don't think our communities would be quite as safe. And I think there's people who, you know, put their lives on the line. So I think that's cool that you said that. And that shows that you're, you're definitely a compassionate and thoughtful person. Because I, I say that, you know, I wouldn't say often, but I've said it a few times. And I think people just make these enemies where it's like, you know, there's a lot of good work and maybe some not bad work, but to really get to it, I'm not a sideline critic. I'd rather sit down with even someone like a Hillary Clinton or a George Bush. If I sat with them, I wouldn't want to yell at them about everything. I would want to hear their side of it, you know, because like, I'm like, what, you know, let's hear what they have to say. Because I know only what the news has told me and, and the mistakes that they've made, but on a world scale, like maybe they're not in control. Like all the conspiracy, maybe there's like multi-layered things where it's like, I, I mean, even in Syria, people are like, oh, we shouldn't go there. We shouldn't. Yeah, I agree. I don't think what we did was right. But then you got Russia there, Iran there, China creeping in. Like who knows what the big chess game is. I'm, I'm just so much more willing to listen than I am to spread too much hate. For every critique I have, I try to layer it with like 20, you know, showing love to these people because who really knows? I can't imagine being somebody like Hillary Clinton and how painful that must be or anybody like at that level to just have that kind of life, just to be that big personality type person. It's, it's so much pressure and it doesn't mean that you're making i I'm not saying morally what I think of her or what I think of George W. Bush, but just in terms of 
having to live like that, it must be very painful. It must be uh, very painful to have all of these various decisions that you're making and all these people that are constantly talking to you. I don't know. Like, I, I think the only way it's not painful is if you have, is if you've made some kind of a peace with a higher power where you, you know what I mean? Absolutely. And with them, I think, too, a lot of people really don't like them. A lot of people do. Same with Trump, though. But at the end of the day, I think when like when I do something wrong or I do something that I know is bad, it hurts me more than it hurts the other person. Or like I'm just like I regret it immediately. And then I like correct myself and make sure I try not to make that mistake again. Where like if, if it is true that they are doing all these nefarious things like every day, and they're really doing all the stuff that they, they don't think is good because there's a possibility they think what they're doing is right. And maybe there's even a you know small possibility that it is right. But if they are what a lot of people think they are is doing all these terrible things and they know it, I'm sure it eats them up alive. And you could kind of see like they're I mean, you know, she's not the happiest character. You know, I've seen her talk. She looks very bitter, very mad for sure. So I, I do think that's how the universe works with with karma, where it's like, you know, you do well. I think you get blessed by the universe and God. And if you do bad, I think it eats you alive. So, you know, only, only they know, only they know the truth. Have you ever heard of the uh, Ramayana? Mm -mm. In the Ramayana, there was this uh, demon named, uh, let's see, what was the demon named? It was uh, Ravana or, uh, yeah, Ravana. There was this demon called Ravana who kidnapped Sita and then Rama, who was the, reincarnation or avatar of uh, the uh, god Vishnu came to rescue Sita from Ravana. And Ravana, deep inside, wanted to be destroyed by Rama. Because when he was destroyed, in a way he was free to join with the Godhead, where he was playing a particular role. And in a way, kind of like that William Shakespeare quote, all the world's a stage and we are all actors, I sometimes see everything that's been going on, whether it's with Trump, whether it's with uh, the deep state or whatever wars that we happen to be in. All of this stuff is teaching us as experiencers in this world. Like I personally think that reincarnation is very likely and mm -hmm. that we have different lessons that we're learning when we're here in this particular body, that there is a very specific reason why I'm here talking to you right now. You're mm -hmm. talking to me. You've had your experiences. I've had my experiences. And when we get out of here, when we go to wherever realm is next, we may have a look back on what have you learned? What did you get out of this life? What did you contribute? What did you accomplish? Mm -hmm. And for certain people, they may play the roles of the demons. They may play the roles of the oppressors for us to learn the lesson of how do we solve this? Do we solve this by uh, uh, you know, being incredibly mean to people who disagree with us or do we solve this in another way? And the mm. thing that I love about the United States of America, much like we have our symbol being the unbuilt pyramid without the top and instead of the top, there's this eye. I mean, I know a lot of people you know, talk about the Illuminati and all that kind of stuff, but that eye, that's the same eye that I see when I close my eyes during meditation. Mm. It's God. It's everything that's just coming out of one central point. But the pyramid itself is not built yet. It's a pyramid that still keeps being built. And mm. part of the building of the pyramid, I think, is in getting rid of all the bad apples, is in having the various reforms that America has had, whether it's getting rid of slavery, whether it's uh, giving women the vote, you know, all of this stuff, it's like this progressive thing, but it has to be maintained going back to the more occult elements in a, let's say Freemasonry and the Temple of Solomon, they have these two columns, the column of severity and the column of mercy. You have to maintain a balance between these two forces. You know, you can't just be all like, you know, immigrants welcome. And then you end up having everybody, you know, getting acid thrown in their face after that. You know, you have to be very, <laughs> you have to be very cautious, but at the same time, be very open. And it's so hard to maintain that balance. People are just foxholing themselves in one area or the other area. And we have to repair all this stuff with our intelligence agencies too. A lot of good people, but the fact that unlike Russia, which is corrupt to the core, we actually have the ability to repair these things. So all mm. the people who are talking about, you know, like, oh, there's no difference between America and Russia. We have just as much corruption as they do. It's like, no, I'm sorry. We actually have the ability to improve it. And, and it's happening. I mean, not as fast as a lot of people would like, but you see, even in the last year or two, that's what I, I'm like, he, he didn't do everything under the sun, but the fact that we've even made this progress. And I, I want to go on what you were saying too. I, 
that's that's the reason I'm I'm so I mean I get a little energetic sometimes but I'm so calm and chill is what you were saying as far as being here before or we're placed here I feel like that's my role and if if the, say the media even though I talk about them a lot if the media wasn't so terrible I wouldn't be here with you I wouldn't have a platform because there'd be no space for me so it's like all the negative opens a space for the positive so I don't fight reality that much I don't fight the left too too hard although I do critique a lot I'm not like out there punching and, and riling all this stuff up because it's what has allowed me to to be me and that's a beautiful thing and that's definitely um why I'm able to be here if, if they were great I wouldn't and on that note I want to say with to, to wrap it up and I'm going to give you one last thing to say is with with the media I I feel what you're saying about you know, um, wooing the other side a little bit. And I guess something that we do agree on, and I'd like to see more, although I do think it's coming from independent media, hopefully they don't censor mm -hmm. us anymore, is the instead of negative about everything and I, like er, er, everything they skew into a divisive manner and we never really get to progress out of that. I would love to see them analyze things more to bring both sides together. But like you said, even maybe maybe that's meant to be bad so then we can have other good media um and on that note you know i'll let you wrap it up but thank you for being here thanks for having this discussion i'm glad i had you on you got a lot of good insight and a lot of uh good demeanor that i think is very very important and i, I wish you the best of luck and everyone to check out your new platform because i think you're going to be uh, you know an energy and a soul that really does make the world better and that's what we need anomaly thank you so much it was a great honor to be here and I just want to say in regards to the mainstream media, I think that there is a knowledge even among them that their time is coming to a close and that a lot of these professional uh, people who comment on uh, whatever they see in the teleprompter that is going away in place of people like you and hopefully people like uh, me and Jules and other independent creators out there whose voices are going to rise up like cream rises to the top not based on whoever they happen to know, but just based on whether what they're saying resonates with people. And I think that there's going to be this moment where a lot of people are gonna start as hippy dippy as it sounds, resonating with each other. I think that we do have extrasensory abilities that have been suppressed for a long time just because nobody bothered to do anything with them. And I think we're going to open up the same quality that let's say uh, uh, tribesmen in the um, African desert have where somebody goes off to hunt and people know whether or not it's been a successful hunt. So they create like a party in advance or they cry, uh, just be sad because the hunt was unsuccessful. Mm. Like a telepathic communication once that party comes back. So I think we can develop that and through that we can be much better with each other. Wow, I like that. And and like, I think you made a good point earlier too, where from slavery to women's rights, a lot of people get caught up in all the negativity. And you know, I do too sometimes, but I'm so grateful and looking at history, if anything, people talk about all the bad stuff. How could you not be grateful? Whether you, you come from Russia, whether you come from slavery or a factory or another country that escaped to come to the United States, how could you not be grateful to live now? Like we're, we're, we're only going up the pyramid. That's completely obvious. I'm, I'm, I'm on with you sensory spiritual stuff i think we've been suppressed heavy for these last hundred years we've still we've still gone up but i see even the trump era and the social media era as the wrecking ball through to our extra sensory stuff to our psychedelic supernatural type powers and even health stuff that you know why yoga and meditation and eastern philosophy that's been around for thousands of years and we're just figuring it out now like you know we're all into yoga these last mm -hmm. five ten years we should have been on this all 1900s, but this is a beautiful time. I do think it's opening. I, I appreciate your perspective and, and your insight. I'm gonna have to look at that Wim Hof uh, breathing. I got into Wim it a Hoff little bit. Method. Wim, Wim Hof method. Yeah, I got into it, and then I, I didn't go the full distance. But when I when I do water breathing things, mm. I try to uh, replicate what what he did. So you know, I can teach you. I, when this goes off, we're gonna get into it. So this was the third uh, Make America Debate Again. I hope you guys appreciate it. It's on Apple Podcasts, I'm sorry, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, if you're listening on there, and then any podcast network that supports that, Make America Debate Again, also YouTube series. I'm here with the wild, wacky, wonderful. I don't know why I was I would say that by default, wild, wacky, and wonderful, but <laughs> Lev Polk Polyakov. Polyakov. Poliakov and check out his YouTube channel. If you're watching on YouTube, it's going to be the top comment or in the description. 
love and jewels break the rules. Take Thank care. You. Thank you so much. Absolutely.